It's always a pleasure to come back to Rockers here in Asia. Singapore, first of all, let's address the elephant in the room. No, this is not my voice. I wish I had this deep voice. Uh, the air conditioning in the plane got me. I also got 300 COVID tests done, all of them negative. So we're good. Uh, there was a lot of questions raised in the hotel and they saw the trash bin filled with empty COVID tests, but we are okay, okay? It's just a bad call. Um, second of all, for those of you that haven't had me before as a professor, the name is Ignacio Vigil, but I go by Nacho. So as I always joke, no crazy story in Vegas involving Mexican snacks or anything like that. It's just short for Ignacio, right? So please do call me Nacho. Um, a little bit about myself. So I've been teaching at Rockers since 2010. Uh, so that's already a long time. Uh, here in Singapore, in China, and in New Jersey. Uh, and I teach managerial economic analysis and aggregate economics. So micro and macro. But the best thing is that I have a full-time job that has nothing to do with academia. So uh, uh, in these classes and today, I'm gonna use some theoretical concepts, but mostly it's gonna be real world stuff, okay? Some applicable stuff. And we're gonna use some examples from my own work and hopefully from uh, the audience. Uh, so right now I'm the head of customer care and operations for an uh, American medical devices company, and I'm in charge of Spain and Portugal. That's what I do uh, on a daily basis. And today we're gonna talk about um, setting up a pricing strategy, as Brian, we were talking before, setting up a pricing strategy in the current inflationary environment. We've talked about this in class for the students in the room, uh, where typically we don't have to have conversations about, I'm gonna raise your prices, and this is happening, I need to raise your prices, right? So I'm gonna give you a few tips, I'm gonna tell you how in my, uh, um, how I believe that should be done from a global and a local perspective. If you have questions along the way, please just stop me. We're among friends. Raise your hand, tell me, hey, Nacho, how about this? How about that? And we'll, uh, we'll sort it out. Okay? Are we ready to rock? Let's rock. So let's start with some context. Some easy context about where we are today in the world. What's going on in the world today? Give me two, three, two or three things that come to mind. Ukraine. 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 That's the first one that comes to mind, right? Ukraine. War in Ukraine. Another one that we just kind of leaving behind, COVID, right? Uh, we have a situation where we have uh, oil prices that went crazy for the longest time. We have the US dollar appreciating tremendously. We have uh, different situations that are coming up, Europe uh, European central banks across the world raising interest rates. So I'm gonna put all that into context from a macro perspective. We're gonna spend five minutes on it. And then we're gonna look into, okay, now we're in the C room, now is the CEO, the CMO, all the C's that are there, and how is this affecting us, okay? So we're living in a world where if we have in a macro world, or we have GDP growth there, and here we have prices, inflation, and we have our aggregate supply there, which is all the amount of goods and services that are being provided, right? And our aggregate demand here, which is how much is being essentially consumed, invested, uh, public spending, all that good stuff, you have an equilibrium. Whatever GDP growth that is, whatever level of inflation is there, these were the happy times. And then a couple of things happened. One of them called COVID, that had a massive, massive effect on aggregate demand. Remember when the world stopped on its tracks? and people just couldn't leave their houses. And also that already had an impact on supply chain that started to be constrained. And then we have a, we mentioned it before the war on Ukraine, that had a massive effect on supply chain on oil, particularly OPEC plus, so Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries plus Russia. Russia, all those expectations about one of the main players that is producing oil now gets into war, so the country, what's gonna happen there? So we're living in a world where aggregate demand was lower and we've had a supply shock. What did, us give, what did that give us? This P high is inflation and low GDP growth. That scenario 
It's called stagflation because you have a stagnate economy but with inflation. So we're not getting any of the good stuff. We're just getting the bad stuff right now. So we are in what's called, I'll write it right here, stagflation. That's the macro situation. How does the macro situation affect us when we get into the boardroom? That's a great question, Brian. Well, the way that it affects us is, what does this mean for us? You'll know that this equation, profit is revenue minus cost. We've seen this in class a thousand times, right? How is this affecting us? How does this translate to, let's do a PNL quickly, an ECPNA. We have our sales. We take our cogs out. It gives us our margin. You have your OPEX. And yes, amortization, depreciation, interest, a ton of all the good stuff. You get to your operating income. So we sit in the boardroom and we're getting attacked where cogs is increasing dramatically, right? It's costing more for everybody to do anything that we're producing. Penn, one of the students in this year's class, was mentioning how he's producing building materials, how for certain materials he, need, he needed stones and something else, I don't remember what it was. The stones are up 40%, four zero, and the other component 25%. And those are materials he needs to produce the product he sells. So there's no two ways about it. It's costing them more to do things. So we've been attacked by cards. If sales don't move, our margin is suffering, right? and therefore operating income. And what companies want is to manage profitable growth. It's not enough with growing, you gotta grow profitably, right? So we've been attacked in cogs. What's going on with sales? If we're in the brink of recession, we're not there yet. Our sales, we know, are not happening yet, but the threat is costs are going up, you're gonna sell less, it's gonna be left, very little margin. So if this is not happening in your companies, it will come. We need to lower OPEX. So what does that mean? Those t &Es, all those trips to visit customers, let's do them digitally. You know headcount? You know those three guys or gals that I promise you you're gonna have next year? Headcount freeze. You know all those things that allows us to do business on the day to day. And companies thought, that through COVID, one of the good things of COVID was acceleration of digitalization, right? Oh, now I don't really need to go to see my customer and we can do it digitally. It so happens, certainly in certain areas of the world, I can talk for uh, Europe, customers were dying to get out of the door as soon as COVID passed. So you would tell them, hey, we can do this virtually and say, that's great, but no, let's meet. I wanna go out, I wanna see you, I wanna talk about this. So. In a situation where sales down, cogs up, and they're asking you to reduce OPEX, we are handcuffed, right? And what's one way of getting out of this? One way of passing those costs to our consumer. So they are the ones that are gonna be at least helping us with this by raising prices, right? And this is what we're gonna talk about today, raising prices in a situation where your revenue is likely to go down and your cost, maybe your variable, certainly your variable cost, which is your raw materials, hourly labor, that kind of things are going up, you're gonna to need to raise prices. And that's what today is about, okay? It's about how do we go about raising prices? How do we build a strategy globally and apply it locally to raise prices? So far, so good. Yes, energized, loving life so far? Good, perfect. So how do we do that? Uh, let's talk about a couple of easy concepts first, and then we'll get into five different steps. I love lists. I have to-do lists of to-do lists that I have to do. So I always give you a list. We're gonna talk about a concept that is being talked in all the boards in the world that is the elasticity of the man. We saw this in class, how uh, when you join any earnings call in Wall Street, they talk about the elasticity of demand. Elasticity. 
whether the customers are fairly elastic or not, whether elasticity is suffering. And we're going to cover that really, really quick. And then we go into practical examples and the real world, which by the way, for those of you thinking of joining the program, you know who you are. Um, that's how we teach. Give you the shortest minimum theory that I possibly can, and then real world, right? Elasticity. We're talking the elasticity of demand. We're really talking how sensitive our customers are to changes in prices. How sensitive. If we have a demand function that looks like this, our demand is going to tell us at different prices what quantities am I going to sell. A fairly flat demand is called fairly elastic. Why? Because a small change in prices, we go P0, Q0, is going to have a small change. It's going to have a significant effect on the quantities that I sell. This is a fairly elastic demand. Examples of elastic demands, all those where there's a large number of substitute products, for example. Uh, an elastic demand, when you go to the grocery shopping, you want to buy bottled water. If you go under six different brands of bottled water and they're all at $1 each, if there's one that is at 95 cents, that's going to sell a hell of a lot. It's a small percentage, right? It's a small change, but it's going to carry a lot of weight. Why? Because it's essentially bottled water. That's why actually bottled water companies do the marketing and advertising to try to convince you this comes from Fiji and you can see through the bottle and it's way more, it's bottled water, okay? That's elastic. On the inelastic, also generic drugs. I have a cold, I went to the pharmacy. I love it when I come here in Singapore to the pharmacy because the first question they ask me is, do you like a um, Western uh, uh, a solution to your problem or an Eastern solution to your problem? I say, give me both, I'll take them both. So. But if I go there and I want to buy paracetamol, generic, I don't care about anything else. If there's three brands and one of them is cheaper, I'll get that one because it's paracetamol, right? But if we were talking a branded drug that I needed a blood thinner, for example, and this blood thinner works for me, is the one that I've been on for years and I don't get side effects and it works for me, that's the one I want. Even if prices go up, if I can afford it, that's the one that I'll get because that demand is fairly inelastic, right? So for the same price change, this P0, if we make the same price reduction, look the difference in the quantities. This works both ways. If I lower prices, if I raise prices, in, my, in this current in this current environment, what we're all trying to determine is, are my customers, is my demand fairly elastic or fairly inelastic? If it's fairly elastic and I tell them I'm going to raise prices, just look at this from this perspective. And instead of going from the blue to the red, we're going from the red to the blue. Look what will happen if I raise prices and they're very elastic, very price conscious. I'm going to lose a lot of business. Whether if my demand is fairly inelastic, if I raise prices, I lose a little bit of business. I always tell sales and marketing executives, you have two jobs. One of them is to pull that demand out as much as possible so you can sell more without having to sell cheaper, pull it out, and then you have to turn it as inelastic as possible. This is not only because of the number of competitors you have, but also your brand equity, right? There's some people that they will have, their, they're on the market for a laptop and they'll buy an Apple. Why? Because they love Apple. And they're not looking at, is the processor quicker and a Lenovo or not? I'm just an Apple guy. Or I drink Starbucks as opposed to this for the coffee because that's the brand I identify with, I like. Those brands have done a fantastic job at that. Early inelastic demand, right? So, so far, we talk about the macro context. And please, I'm from Spain. Therefore, when I get going, I may sound like a machine gun. So just raise your hand, just say, hey, Nacho, time out. Time out, lower the speed a little bit, and I will be so glad. 
So, so far we look at the macro context, right? Stagflation, great concern, every company in the world in how are we gonna tame those variable costs? That cogs that is going up, what can we do with that? Already some OPEX measures being put into place, brink of recession in many places. That's the macro context. And in the micro context, when we're being asked to raise prices, one of the first things that we need to figure out is, are we fairly, do we have fairly elastic demand or fairly inelastic demand? Because if we're one of these, the conversation is gonna be tougher than if we're one of these, okay? So now we've determined, okay, we need to raise prices. How do we go about this? Do we just go, okay, from tomorrow, prices are 5% across the board. That's one way of doing it. I don't think it's the most efficient way, the most organized way, the most trackable way. So I'm gonna give you a couple of other options. Before giving you the, the steps, I need, there's five steps. Uh, let's talk about um, global versus local, okay? You may have the global organization, <laughs> excuse me, the global organization, that says this is the CEO of the company that is sitting in China, the US, Spain, Australia, whatever that may be, Nairobi, that says, as a company, we need to raise prices. The fact that as a company, you need to raise prices does not mean you need to raise prices by the same amount, the same way to everybody, okay? Because customers, business models, the, even the demands, whether it's uh, elastic or inelastic, are gonna change from country to country. I would argue are gonna change from region to region within a country, or even from customer to customer within the same region, right? So one of the things that I would recommend, can I raise this? Yes, right? That I can tell you is that it has to be global. What does global mean? Great question, Ray. You asked the same great questions that you did when you were in class. It has to be local, okay? It has to be global. What does it mean? You need some sort of a global approach, global or a holistic approach. But then you need local execution. Local execution and some flexibility. Yes, you've told us to raise prices. Yes, we're gonna raise prices. But now in my market, we have to do it this way. And you need to trust your management that they know what they're doing. We were told prices have to go up. That's a fact. Prices have to go up. Within Europe, it doesn't make sense to raise prices the same way in Germany than in Spain, for example. It doesn't make sense, for example, for capital equipment, medical devices that you make. You may have a business model in Germany where hospitals buy equipment or a business model in Spain where customers don't buy the equipment. But if they don't have that equipment, they won't buy all the fungible, which is what you make all the money with. So it's not the same. And that has to be taken into consideration. Why global? Because pricing, so let me talk about global first, the global part. Pricing is part of your brand. Pricing is linked to your brand. So whatever you do with pricing is gonna enhance your brand, it's gonna tarnish your brand, it's gonna help your brand, or it's gonna have negative consequences. Also, because you want that approach to be consistent. Cross markets. What do I mean by that? I mean that it cannot be hunky dory either because then there's no control whatsoever. And to ensure, very important, to ensure efficiencies, efficiency across sales and marketing. These are big words to say everybody has a boss. 
So the sales and marketing guy in Spain reports to the EMEA one that reports to the global one that eventually reports to the CEO. If you want to collect all that information, if you're going to know how things are being done, if you want to be able to assess the situation, there has to be some consistent approach. And you don't want your sales and marketing guys running across, running around like headless chicken, trying to figure out what to do with prices at different places. But then the local execution. Why local? Because, I'll get rid of this. You need local execution. There we go. The local part. First of all, because you may have different customer types in country A than in country B. Maybe country A, it's all um, mostly the public sector. So I have a contract signed for a public tender and it lasts for five years and that's signed with the administration. In my case, it's a public hospital. If I go to the public hospital and say, hey, you know this contract that we have awarded for five years for you to buy from us whatever amount, I'm gonna double the price. You know, tell us that's great. That's also illegal. You have a signed contract with us and therefore this we're gonna buy for five years. When this is over, we can talk. But for this amount of time, those products is this price. You're already tied up there. You cannot touch that. There may be other countries where you can, but that's why it's important that it's local, right? So the customer type, and we'll talk about customer segmentation, the customer type, whether it's was the split between public and private. Um, the business model, very important. The third one is one of my favorites. Your sales force capabilities. We are assuming that in an environment where we need to go to talk to, a, to the customer and say, we're going to raise your prices, we assume that our people are ready for that. Maybe they've never had that conversation with any customer ever. Because maybe we're working with a very elastic demand that is price-driven, that is raised to the bottom, and the customer are comparing two products and the only thing they're looking at is price. So how are you going to have that conversation? What tools, and we'll talk about that when we talk about change management, what tools are you giving your sales force for them to have that conversation, right? Um, so sales force capabilities, and we're going to talk about this precisely later on. And very, very important, what data do you have? If I ask you, can you honestly tell me how much do you charge your customers in the, each customer, the past year, or each product or service you sell? How does that fare against what you were supposed to charge them? Do, do we have an easy way of uh, click, click, click? Here it is. If you do, good for you. I've never worked in a company that has that though. Of course you have them, Sumik. I'm still in shock when you told me you were, well, I don't want to reveal where you were, reveal where you work or your name, for that matter, but when you told me, oh, it's list price, and then we go up from there. I said, how is that possible? I thought this was list price and then getting discount. So, no, sorry, this is here. You know, there's sort of this platform. Yes. It's an online platform whereby the client can go straight to that platform, right? And select, okay, I need this, 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 I need this product, I need this, 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 and all that, and they will get the quotation immediately. Yeah. So, of course, behind all those, they have already input numbers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but isn't that way more? Absolutely. So, uh, internet, the World Wide Web, has had wonderful things, but has had two bad things. One is price transparency. Yeah. Now I know exactly how much everybody else can charge. Mostly, mostly in the consumer, uh, consumer goods. Absolutely. I want to know how much is this TV. I'll go to the shop. I'll choose this the one that I like, and then I go home, look for the cheapest one. And I know exactly where to find it. And I'll buy it online. The second thing is. For those of us that work in operations, that is regarding logistics and to get stuff from A till B when it should be there and whatnot, is that every customer thinks that 
If Amazon is doing it, why can't you? If, Amazon, if I order a pen that is worth $1 from Amazon, and I know exactly where it is, all the steps on the way, it's come all the way from China, how can I not know what I purchased from you, exactly what it is at each point, and I don't get an email or recommendations last time you purchased this? Because Amazon has made a zillion dollar investment in that technology, right? But to answer your question, Jay, yes, it's all of price transparency. Very good question. Because we should sell on value. You don't sell on the product. You don't sell on the technical capabilities. You sell on the value that that adds to the customer. You should sell on what issues has the customer and how is my product and services fulfilling those. Because now we'll talk about that in a minute. Time has come, citizens of the world. The time has come to cash on all those equity checks with our customers, all those favors we've been doing throughout the years, all those late night calls because there's an urgency, I'll sort it out for you. The time has come to cash on those checks. The time has come to go to our customers and say, now it's me who needs to ask for your support. It's me who needs to ask for your help. And if you've been selling on value and the customer values you, your product, your company, you yourself as a person, they'll be more likely to help you out. Right? Everybody has a boss. So they'll say, I cannot, I cannot give you 5% more. I just cannot. But I'll take two and a half. Well, that's something. Okay? So data, hugely important. Hugely important. I'm a strong believer in data-driven decisions. But the KPI is the beginning of the conversation. KPI is not the answer by itself. The KPI is, okay, now we know where we are. We don't want to know where we want to get. How do we get there? So we're going to touch upon these four now when we go over the five steps. How are we doing so far? Tipa, all good? Living the rocker's dream? Yes? Good? All right, perfect. So let's look into those five steps. And, and I'll uh, we'll explain them as we go along. Let's see. Step number one. Your status quo. Where are you today? What is your current position? What prices are you selling at today? Uh, are you a premium? Premium pricing? Are you a value pricing? Are there some markets where you're using penetration pricing to get into the market? Are you, where are you? What type of pricing strategy? Are you following? Are you following price scheming? Are you, there's, in this class, we see 25 different pricing strategies, okay? About how you could be pricing your product. So the first thing is, okay, where are you? Because remember, pricing is also personal. It's attached to the brand, but it's also personal. You want to charge me more? Why? What did I do to you? We were talking in class about a recent conversation one of the students had with the customer where the customer was taking personally this price increase. And we're lucky that customers around the world expect the price increase. They know it's coming because this is a macro situation. This is not, I just want to make a couple more points of margin on you. I want you to pay the party. No, it's like, if we don't raise prices, there'll be no party to pay, right? So um, understand where you are. There's a recent uh, Boston Consulting Group survey uh, about pricing. Okay, this is a couple of years old, I believe, still uh, uh, during COVID, I believe. And that said that 50% of companies, 50, one in two, they do not have a clear pricing strategy defined, or is not well communicated, or is not aligned with the different businesses. So 50%, yeah, they, uh, they manage prices somehow, but they don't have a clear or well-defined in place uh, or not communicated with organization pricing strategy. Two thirds, so this is not clear pricing strategy. Two thirds of companies, they cannot track prices properly. 
they cannot get down to the level of detail that is needed um, uh, tracking actual prices. 80%, 80% lack the data capabilities to make effective moves, effective pricing moves. This is huge. 50% don't have a clear strategy, there is no communicated, there's no line. Two thirds or so 66% cannot track prices. 80% don't have the data capabilities to actually tell you the prices that were charged. And uh, companies that have a dedicated organization for pricing strategy and execution, they said that they can raise profit between two and 3% higher profit. The ones that have a dedicated pricing strategy uh, organization. Why does this happen? Because pricing is something that everybody touches but nobody owns. So who owns pricing? You go to your company, okay, who owns pricing? Who's the responsible? Who's a boss of mine used to say? Who is the neck to choke? <laughs> who is it when I wanna know exactly what's going on and I pick up the phone, which number do I dial? Don't tell me well, sales, marketing, operation, who? Who is the person in charge? Who's responsible for pricing? Because everybody's touching it. Everybody's lowering pricing, raising, giving rebates, giving discounts, doing this, doing that, bundling and whatnot. But who's responsible? That makes it tougher to manage. If you don't know who the responsible is, it makes it tougher to manage. So this is the first step. Status quo. Where are we? Right? The second one is actually developing that strategy. So develop the pricing strategy. In this case, we're talking about raising those prices, right? So how do we do this? First, at global, this is mostly where global come in, right? These are those global principles. Those global principles are about our strategic objectives. So what do we wanna do with pricing? We wanna gain market share? Because right now we're in a situation of protecting actually what we have, right? But do we wanna gain market share? Is that what we wanna do? Do we want to um, increase the basket volume? Do we wanna change the product mix? what we sell, what do we want to do with this? Really important, do we want to change who we are? That sounds deep, right? Change who we are. Maybe we're not premium, we want to become premium. Maybe we want to become economy, I don't know. But do we want to change who we are? So what are those global principles? Um, I can tell you an example with a pricing, not a pricing, a price raise, but a price decrease. An example that we saw in class, I don't know if you guys remember, Armani. Back in the day when you went to buy Armani shirts, it was like 150 bucks. It was an Armani shirt. Wow, Italian, silk or whatever. Great. And then fast fashion came along. Zara, Spanish, by the way. Uh, H&M, Mango, Spanish, by the way. And they came along. And just, you know, a little publicity for the country home country um go there beautiful place visit places spend some money drink sangria hire a couple of people so uh fast fashion came along and what happened that now you could buy a nice dress shirt for 50 bucks so i can get three shirts for the price of one armani shirt what did armani do did armani lower their prices to say okay we'll compete with you guys did they want to change who they were no they came up with armani change you want a money shirt? You can buy now. It's sort of our money. It's going to cost you 60 bucks. 50 as Zara, 60 our money change. Still premium within the fast fashion. And then if you want another our money, you want a prop, proper our money, you can still have it for 150 bucks. No problem. That's through customer segmentation. They understood who they were. They didn't want to stop being who they were. They just wanted to be also something else, right? 
So those global principles. But locally, here comes the trick. What do we do locally developing this strategy? Let's define the scope, very, very important. What do I mean by that? Globally, they tell me our objective is to raise prices. I'm making this up 5% across the board. I have two options. I can just send a letter to every customer and say, from tomorrow, 5%, hope for the best. And I can tell my management that, okay, 5% across the board. If our revenue is I'm making this up 100 million, we should get 105 million. Center is part of you, so nothing else changes. Job well done, I'm going to bed, that was awesome, what a great day, see you tomorrow. But what if my scope, these are all my sales to all the customers, so every one of these little squares is one product customer. What if this I cannot touch because of public contracts? For example, I need to know that. I need to know that because then the 5% is not going to be on 100 million. It's going to be on whatever this is, 75 million. It's already changing. And you would have set the right expectation. It's already changing. Now it's not 5% on 100 million. It's going to be on 75 million because this I cannot touch. I need to know this through the data. I need to know who my public customers are and my, versus my private. And within the public, it depends on legislation of the country. In Spain, for example, public customer can purchase from us, has to purchase from us through a public tender process, highly regulated, that says, I need to buy something that is going to achieve this function. And I'm going to give these points for criteria for how uh, this technicality is, for how green your company is, how it's going to take for the product to get here blah, blah, blah. And you're going to submit a close bid and you're going to get a word. So very regulated. But if it's less than 15,000 euros, then it's not so regulated. Then there's some exceptions. And if it's less than 5,000 euros, even more. So maybe from your public customers, you're getting a ton of your revenue without a public tender. Maybe you can touch that saying, okay, I'm gonna raise prices on that. Maybe you could. In any way, you need to know what's the red zone. You know what, management? Looks like the US flag. Maybe this we cannot touch. So this is the scope, this is the universe. And how you find that scope, that's the data analysis we're talking about, through uh, the data. You can also use, to define the scope, those elasticities that I was telling you about. What if elasticity and customer segmentation? I work at a company in the US, industrial company, that shall remain nameless unless you go to my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> Shout out to Sigma. <laughs> Sigma. Uh, that was basically an industrial company where we were sourcing in China and India fittings, cast iron fittings. There's a pipe that goes this way, pipe goes this way, you need an elbow. And made a humongous amount of dollars selling those, okay? And the point was, okay, we want to raise prices or we want to get visibility into what prices we're charging first. So let's imagine the G3, three customers that I can segment together by the type of customer, whether it's public or uh, private, by the size of sales with you, by the type of products that I sell you, whatever segmentation, that's segment A. And through the data, I see that this type of products or this type of customer, I've charged them actual orders, actual invoices. There have been some times that I've charged, making this up, a thousand bucks, sometimes 800 and sometimes 500. So with this data, you can already tell, I know that the best case scenario is I can charge them all a thousand. Why? We've done it before. 
for this type of customer, we have done it before. So I know there's a ton of room here, but if I see that all of those customers are in the thousand, thousand and thirty, and a thousand and twenty, I know it's around a thousand. So there's not much room there to do. But through the elasticity and customer segmentation, you're going to see how elastic they are for price change. That's something else you could use. Um, list prices. There's some customers, list price, definition of a list price for me is, I don't know you from Adam. We've never worked together. You walk through the door and said, I'll have one of those. And we say, that cost a hundred bucks. This is, I'm talking B2B. 100 bucks. You typically don't sell at that price. At least price, then you have discounts, you have pricing for your eight customers, blah, blah, blah. But there's an amount of business in certain industries that comes through the list price. It's just people that just buy something as simple as a cable. Even your customers, oh, I need a spare cable. I need this. And the spare cable, maybe it's just $1. If you raise that to 150, which is a 50% increase, it's no harm. It's just 50 cents on that one. It's not something that, first of all, affects anybody's pockets tremendously. But if you're selling globally 10 million of those, excuse me, if you raise that 50 cents, all of a sudden, you've got a ton of revenue you were encountering on. So lease prices mainly directed at those customers where they just buy at least price, that you don't have a contract behind it, you don't have a negotiation behind it, etc. Um, all of this to tell you what, what, what I like you to get out of this, be specific with your target. It's not the same to have a conversation with a customer where you go, prices up 5% from tomorrow. It's not the same, the same. And, and, and all of these conversations should start with the macro context. You and I know we're living in an inflation world right now. You and I know I haven't touched your prices in the past X months, which means I've been absorbing that cost. I cannot do that any longer. So price raise is a fact. And I will hate to lose you as a customer. I'll hate it. But if you don't want to place an order with me, so be it. But if you place it, it's going to be this price. But I think it's much more powerful if that comes with, I'm not going to touch this product. Yes, Steve. Before you walk in. So, so part of the strategy, and we'll talk about it when you said developing the strategy, actually implementing it, is you need to have support from the top. Your boss, your boss's boss, your boss's boss's boss, and so on, all the way to the CEO, need to know this comes with some risk. That is, it's going to be successful with some customers. And we'll raise prices and we'll be fine. And we may lose some business. And if the expectation is you're not going to lose any business, that's unrealistic. That's just not fair. And you should say so. If I came to you and say, Deepa, from tomorrow, 5% up in every customer, and they better not say no. Well, there's some people are going to say no to me. So we're going to lose some business. We need to be ready for that. The good news is in this environment, Everybody's raising prices. So you're not going to be seen like, oh, here comes Lipa from company A raising my prices when everybody else is not doing it. Right now is much more the question who's first. We'll talk about first mover advantage in a minute. So um, I believe if you're targeted and specific, I'm not going to raise your prices there. For these products, I'm not going to touch them. I'm going to keep on absorbing the cost. But in this, I need to raise your prices X percent. You've done your homework. That has to be eighty percent of your revenue. So I guess. I guess sorry, sorry, no, 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 please, please. I guess my, my question is about the customer that you know for a long time, yeah. and then you have to get yeah. And you know you're going to lose that, especially in Asia. You know, it's a very touchy thing. Like sometimes they sort of pricing is personal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You need you need to do your homework. You need to know what's realistic and what's not in terms of what I sold this customer in the past X time, the last year, for example, how much realistically I can, how many products bring in 80% of my revenue, first of all. So those are the ones that I can target. Are those tied to any long-term contract or not? 
okay, so this is something that I just give a quote. Then the conversation, it's a tough conversation. Absolutely tough. Pricing is personal. Netflix raised their prices, I believe, two or three years ago. There were riots in the streets in the U.S. How dare you raise my prices one dollar? Because it was personal. Here in Asia, even more so, in certain cultures. Now, how, that's why what I mentioned, and we we'll talk about it in a minute, how you prepare yourself and the sales force to have that conversation. Because we're assuming they're ready. Most sales force are not ready for this because they haven't had the conversation. But you need to know when you go there that maybe you lose that customer. Maybe you do. That's why I meant by it's time to cash on those equity checks, those sweat, blood, and tears that you've been doing through the years with those customers in terms of you've been there for them. Remember when you had an issue, you called me 9 p.m. on a Saturday because it had to be there on Monday, wasn't going to arrive, and I tracked it down. And it's not a matter of you listing all you've done for them. But you've done enough for them. You've provided value, your service. You've been there for them. Now it's time for them to be there for you. It's as simple as that. Because they're going to need to buy the product if their business is still going on. And it's a matter of buying it more expensive from you or more expensive from her. But it's going to be more expensive because of the current environment environment that we have okay so be specific with your target i'm raising this much here and this is why and this i'm not touching it so i'm still going to absorb some of the cost but you need to help me out here this is when we stop talking about customers and we start talking about partners with partners we've been we've been partnering partners we've been partnering for years now together I've helped you out, you helped me out. That's the relationship we have. That's how our companies operate together. This is not just someone who walks out of the street and says, I'm going to raise your prices. It's me. Now is the time to cash those checks. Um, because pricing is a complex thing if you want to do it right. If you're just going to say 5% up on everything, that's easy. I can do that. I could be the most successful salesman in the world, any product or service. If you give me price freedom, how much does this go? Are you selling this for a thousand bucks? You can have it for one dollar. I'm gonna sell a hell of a lot. I'm a great sales. It's not about that. It's about profitable growth. Yes. Yeah. The more information you have, the better. That's for sure. Because there are clients who are willing to pay more. Yes. Okay. You did that, Yes. And they have the trust. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I mean, uh, in, I have an experience in my previous uh, previous company where I was project. Project. Yes. So we submit a tender, right? Because I was involved in the tender. Yeah. Uh, there's certain clients whereby not necessarily you are the lowest output you. So I might have a certain budget. Yeah, even though you are not the lowest, but you can prove that your certain product is better. Yeah. Better, yeah. Better, yeah. Still yeah. And your product is still better than the competitor, you can still prove it. You just need it to be paid a little bit more expensive. And you're telling me, well, if the budget is already fixed, that's like those contracts that I said I cannot do anything with. But then is when it comes, this project, you can have it at that price because I understand this budget is fixed. For next project, just remember, just put on your budget. If you want this product, it's no longer 100. Now it's 105. Because that's, that's what the product is going to cost. So maybe you're not getting that now, but at least you can execute the price increase in the future. But at least the trend is for management. Once again, knowing your data, these ones, I couldn't raise prices this year. The budget for the project was set in all of them, so I couldn't. I already told them that next year, if they have another project, this is going to be more expensive. That's, that's reasonable to me. As a manager, that's all something reasonable as opposed to I couldn't raise the prices come on I'm gonna be pissed off how am I gonna do that right um, okay so we've developed the strategy now we're gonna formalize it now it's okay we know what we're gonna do we have our global principles we've defined the scope Spain is gonna do this Malaysia is gonna do that uh, China is gonna do that Australia is gonna do that fine now let's finalize it let's put this in motion. Let's get the party started.
such an exciting subject. I get chills, they're multiplying, and I'm losing control. Rings a bell? All right, formalize the strategy. Step number three. Formalize the strategy. How do we do that? Great question, Deepa, great question. First of all, number one, and this is the most important of them all. This is critical. Support from the top. If the CEO doesn't believe in this, or the CEO believes in this by the president of the company in your country doesn't believe in this, or if the head hunter in your country does not believe on this, you have zero chances of success. Zero. Because what's the number one, what's the most important thing for me in my work? Whatever is the most important thing for my boss, my work. Because his priorities become mine, become mine, become mine of my supervisors, managers, the team, whatever. So they have to believe in the methodology. They have to, if the president of sales believe 5% up for everybody, and the CEO or the strategic direction is different, no, we should dimension, see where we go, et cetera, et cetera. That's not gonna work. Everybody has to be aligned. It's easy for the sales force to find a scapegoat if they can. But they're telling us to do this from corporate. corporate. We talk about corporate as if it was a person, right? That most people hate. Well, they're coming from corporate. And depends on the company. The company I was before, it was Germany. Germany called. And I'm like, what was it? Angela Merkel? She goes, no, Germany called. Now it's Kerkrad in Holland. Kerkrad called. Okay, who's that person? How do, who's the neck to choke, remember? So they need to be aligned. You have to have the support from the top. The whole organization needs to know and feel this is important and this is going to happen. We are going to raise prices and we are counting on you to help us. And we're going to give you the tools, but we are going to raise prices. So support from the top. Second, all those guidelines, what we're going to do, why we're doing this, etc. We need to have internal published guidelines. This is a best practice. We need to have somewhere internal published guidelines. I'm not suggesting you put in a document or a SharePoint or the website. We're raising prices and with all the details. So that goes into the competition real quickly. But there has to be some sort of um, communication plan to communicate to the organization. This is what we're doing. This is why we're doing this. This is why this is important. Third one, to me, second in importance after that one, change management. I have worked with Salesforce in the past, different industries, different countries that were just not ready to have this conversation in the US, in Spain. Why? They never had it before. Depends on the industry. If you have, remember the elastic demand. If your conversation typically is to hold on prices or give a discount that is lower than the competition, am I going to go through the door? You mentioned Deepa, I'm going to lose this customer. And, and it's personal. How am I going to go through the door and say, sorry, I need to raise your prices. That change management and training give the tools to people so they can have the conversation, it's essential. They need to believe the prices need to be changed. Uh, research suggests that for someone to do something they don't really believe in, you need to hammer the message up to 17 times for them to start believing it. 17 times, that's a lot of, that's a lot of times. If I told you, if I really believe we had to close that door and I had to convince you, Close that door, Jay. Close that door, Jay. Close that door, Jay. Close that door, Jay. Close it. That's five. That's 17. So those messages have to come through the organization, the CEO, those newsletters that come out, president in the country, your team leader, yourselves, if you're the manager, telling you this is happening. This is why this is important. This is how we're going to do it. These are the tools we're going to give you to do that. Because 
And you have to give them those key messages that I told you about the macro environment and, and whatnot. Um, you may get some churn. There'll be some, some uh, victims of this. There'll be some people that may just go, you know what? All these data-based analysis that now I have to use on this conversation, I have to like, right, this is not for me. I'm gonna find another job selling the way I've sold my whole life. Because now we're asking Salesforce some things that we didn't ask before. 20 years ago, you were a good salesman or a saleswoman if you sold stuff, period. That's all you were asked for. You need to hit a million? Did you hit a million? Yes, you're great. No, you're not great, what happened? It happens two more times, you're out. Next one through the door. Now we're asking our sales force, you need to hit your target, but make sure you use the CRM system, customer relationship management system, like a sales force to document everything you do, right? Make sure all the admin stuff now, you do it yourself and it's being done through these tools that change constantly. Make sure for inventory reconciliations, you go and count the stuff through the barcode work. So we're asking them for a lot of stuff. This is the toughest one of them all. Have a conversation you don't want to have that may end up with you losing a customer. That just goes against the grain of every sales, right? Um, very important. How are we gonna know if this is working? KPIs. You're gonna set your KPIs. You're gonna set, okay, this is why we're changing, right? So we know number one was the status quo. We know where we're coming from, we know where we are. We know why we're doing this, right? We know exactly where our possibilities locally and how we're gonna do it locally. Everybody's aligned, we have support. We've given the tools to the organization to execute on this. And this is what we're gonna measure. There's some KPIs that are favorite of mine. There's one that is called profit leakage. Typically, sales guy, Salesforce, we measure them on top line. Remember that PL sales, blah, blah, blah. On top line, do you hit your sales or not? And typically, we don't give the Salesforce cost information. There's some industries, industries that do or that don't. Why? Because if you're selling at a 1,000 and your cost is 400 and you have that margin, it's difficult to encourage commercial teams to sell close to a thousand because they go immediately, why? We have so much room here, why don't we sell at 800? Right, we're still making a lot of money, just not the, the one we wanna make, right? So I totally lost my train of thought. I was gonna make a extremely smart comment and tell you a very nice story and I totally lost my train of thought. Jay, how are you doing? Bring me back. We're in Singapore, we're doing this seminar, Yes, thank you. KPIs, profit leakage. You see that happened as soon as you talk about something else. Profit leakage or price stickiness. Those are KPIs that are useful. What's the profit leakage? Well, we wanted you to sell this that was a thousand. We wanted you to sell at a thousand and fifty, a five percent increase. That was the price we wanted you to sell. Let's analyze the data, of course. How many times did you sell that product at this price? Profit leakage is, if you didn't, how much profit, how much profit is missing here that we could have got? That's very powerful. And if you tie compensation to those or price stickiness, I'm not gonna give you cost information, but I want you to sell at 1,050. Not everywhere, not to every customer, but we've done the analysis and for these customers, we said that we can do it, 1,050. And I see that 95% of the time, you're still sending 1,000. You're not doing well. Because we want that, making this up, 75%, three out of every four customers are our target, you stick to that price. Very powerful. And if you tie to compensation, the most powerful of them all. Because then 
they are aligned. Then the organization is aligned. This is so important to us. We're going to track it. But how much you get, it's going to depend on it. How much you get paid. Now people get responsive. Now, okay, okay. What are we talking about? This is the 17th time you tell me, but now you mentioned that how much I make is tied to that. Oh, now I'm listening. What do you need me to do? Right? Um, yes. Yes. Commercial team, mainly. Commercial team. If you said the KPS on the commercial team, what I was talking about is we want to sell at, uh, we were selling a thousand for this product, for this type of customer. We want you to sell a thousand and fifty. That's the five percent that we want extra. And we're going to track how many times you're selling at thousand and fifty versus thousand. We're going to track it. We're going to be able to sit here and tell you 83.4% of the times you hit the price target. Congratulations, because the KPA was 75, you're doing great. You're going to get an extra kick on your bonus. But the CPS are The what? I'm sorry? The price. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not talking about, about Cox. We need to worry about that. But right now we're in a situation that Cox is not going up because of something the company can really control. Oh, yes. Cox is going up for everybody, right? Yes, you want to make a comment? Oh, uh, Cox is just going up for everybody. And you cannot put on the commercial team the charge of Cox. They're not in charge of that. That's a different department. You should have your KPIs about this with all the departments, manufacturing, logistics. What are you doing to find sources in a cheaper way? Where are we sourcing them to take into consideration, into consideration the current currency swings? Logistics, how much is costing us? to bring this stuff from one place to another. Okay, this is more expensive. I get it. The stones in our example before, 45% more expensive. Who's shipping those stones? Which company is doing that for us? How much are they charging us? Can we find something cheaper? Does it make sense? We try to reduce. Thinking about something, and you heard me say this in class, you cannot cut your way into profitability forever. You cannot cut your way into profitability forever. So if your profit is your revenue and your cost, essentially, your whole business strategy cannot be solely based on this. Yeah, you need to be lean. You need to be mean. You need to reduce cost as much as possible. Yes. But eventually, you need to sell more stuff, right? Eventually, you need to either sell more stuff at the same price, say at a higher price. So you cannot do this forever. You should be focusing on that, so in these times, but you need to raise that top line. That's a different thing. Yeah, if, if we're talking, if today was about, or maybe uh, next year I'll do two of these separate, or we'll combine them, that is about the operating income, like, okay, how do we manage the sales? And then what can we do about cost, OPEX, and some best practices? We can totally do that. But for today, that's a different window. Those are the people. How yes. In my world, it's tough because it depends on if it's a change or not. In terms of, are the commercial teams being now rewarded just based on sales? The answer is yes, then this is gonna be a change. Because now you're saying, yeah, you need to hit your target, but it's also important how many times you sell at this price. And it's also important that you don't leave much profit on the table. So then that's change. Change on what? The number one most important thing, my pocket. So now you're telling me how much money at the end of the month is going to my pocket, not the companies, not the division, not my pocket, the one that it pays the bills and feeds my children, that depends on something else. That's a big change from a personal point of view. If they were already rewarded on something else other than top sales, maybe margin, no, you, you need to sell a million, but we need a 35% margin. And we're going to report on that. Then, you, then it's easier because it's not just how much you sell, it's how you sell it to then entering the price conversation is much more natural because in the margin, that's, that's embedded your pricing. So that's, that's, in my particular case, it's a tough thing because it's just sales, right? 
But I also tell you that at the beginning, a year ago, we were already talking about we're going to need to raise prices. And the initial reaction across the industry was we cannot do that. That's going to be impossible. How are we going to raise prices? Now, the meetings that we're having, it's no longer a question if we're going to raise prices. It's how we're going to raise prices. So everybody evolves, right? Okay, so now we've formalized the strategy. Now it's time to implement, right? Let's try to manage the implementation. So let's do that. How are we doing, guys? Is this useful? Is this something you feel that is applicable to you? If you say yes, I scream it out loud for the camera. Okay, perfect. So now we're going to manage the implementation, which is the... We're going to manage the implementation. Um, this is no different than any other uh, implementation of any, any change, right? You need to have a consistent message. And often, remember that research, 17 times the message. This is not just, OK, we go. Let's raise prices. No, this has to be something that is uh, talked about continuously. Find your internal champions. Every team has someone that is going to adopt change quicker than others. It's going to adopt a new technology quicker. You roll out Salesforce, and everybody goes to a room the first day. Oh my God, I have no idea how you use this. But there's one person that is like, oh yeah, this is intuitive. I can do this. And then something funny happens. Nobody is listening to the trainer anymore. Now they're looking at their people. This is one of us. And he understands it. How do you do that? Where do you click? How do you... Find those guys that have drank the Kool-Aid and now believe in that price increase, that understand the tools you've given them, those champions. Those are the ones you want kind of passing that gospel on to the rest of the team. Run pilots. Run pilots and get early wins. So you don't need to go all at once either. Maybe you can do a phased approach. But news travel fast. And as soon as you start raising pricing, prices, customers are going to know, right? So pilot and get early wins. Um, and I have a question mark here about first mover advantage. Tell you a true story. We were discussing, okay, we're going to raise prices. We have the plan. We're doing the data analysis. We're going to change management. Is it too soon? Is it going to be too soon? Are we going to be the first ones through the door? That's a key question. I'm going to talk to Deepa. Deepa is my customer. And it's four main competitors. Eventually, that's the beauty of this. Eventually, we know everybody's going to end up raising prices one way or another, right? So we know that all four of us are going to walk through the door to see you. If that's the case, I do believe in first mover advantage. I do believe that if you have a targeted message, you've done your homework, and you're the first one through the door, that you can get a price increase. You have the same chances as everybody else. But if you're the first one, first of all, they have no point of reference customer. Everybody else, raise them 1%. You're screwed. All that analysis you've done, all that good stuff, you're done. Because now they can compare. Right? They say that the best way of selling a $10,000 watch to put it next to a $50,000 watch is by comparison. Right? So uh, if you're the first one and you've done your homework, I believe is, you have a first mover advantage. I believe as a totally personal opinion. Because every month that you're not raising that prices, that's means revenue. And not the competition may come in and have that conversation for you. It's not gonna be pleasant whether you're the first one, the second, the third one, or the fourth one. But if you're the fourth one, maybe 
customer is already bored of having this conversation to begin with, right? I believe the way I approach it is, Jay, if you and I are good friends and I have something to tell you, the sooner I tell you, the better. Because we are partners, remember? We are friends. So, hey, Jay, you're not going to like this, but I need to tell you. I'm not going to wait seven months to tell you or everybody else, and then I'm the last one. So I believe there's a first move advantage. If this is a unilateral move, nothing is happening. You don't see in the newspapers raw materials going up, the war on Ukraine, etc., and you're going to be the only one through the door, that's a different environment. That you may think when is going to be the right, the appropriate time to have that conversation. But if everybody's going to be doing it, all the kids are going to be doing it, it's not going to be appropriate time anyway. So you might as well just go through it. Um, and then, last but not least, now we're uh, rocking and rolling. This whole process, all those lessons learned, all the stuff that we, we've implemented, all that data analytics, all that alignment, all that change management we perform, it'll be a shame if it just disappears, right? So, the last but not least, you rate. And reformulate regularly. How? You could make this part of your planning cycle. Every year, there's a conversation, serious conversation, data analysis about pricing. And remember, could mean, doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna raise prices every year, but that you know what you're doing with pricing because you actually looked at it, right? So, in, or planning cycle, that it depends on each company, but that plays the budget cycle. So typically, when you're thinking for the next year, my company, we follow the calendar year for the, as a fiscal year. We start working on our next year's budget, uh, provision and whatnot. During August timeframe, August beginning of September, we present those numbers at a country level because that needs to be rolled out, EMEA level, global level. And then the answer is like, okay, we're satisfied with that or not. I need some more money. And then it cascades down. And, and it depends if it's a top to bottom approach where the head of the company says, next year, we have to grow 10%, make it happen. And then it goes, okay, where do I get that growth? Or a bottoms up approach, which is, tell me how much you think I'm gonna grow next year, and let's see what it accounts to. So it depends. But whatever your planning cycle is, pricing should be part of the conversation. Because typically, sales is part of the conversation. How much are you gonna sell next year? Yeah. Yeah. So this is now. All that I told you is now. You should be, depends on the country, depends on the industry, depends on many things. But for me, we're already late, for example. Why? Because all this time you're not raising prices, you're absorbing costs. All that cogs, that's something that you're eating for your customer every day that goes by. So this exercise needs to happen now. And then what I mean is that when you're planning for next year, so now, now is the planning for next year already, so it won't happen. But that when you get to next year and you're planning what you're going to do in 2024, you need to take, okay, guys, what are we going to do with pricing? Where are we now with pricing? You have your KPIs to know, are we sticking to the plan or not? Is it working? Is it not? Are there the customers that we didn't raise at the time that we can raise now, uh, the product mix that we should be touching now. So all I say is part of the conversation in a structured way. Okay. So um, as a wrap up, we came from the macro stagflation, high prices, inflation everywhere, with low economic growth. That's affecting our PL. We have our cogs going up, restriction in OPEX. Threaten on sales, how do we raise prices? And we've talked about how, first of all, the status quo, where are we? What are we doing with prices today? How much are we charging? Does our brand have anything to do with our prices or not? Second, 
is when we define the strategy, local, global principles, but local execution and flexibility, very important. What works in Malaysia may not work only in Spain. Within the same region, what works in Germany may not work in Spain. So you need to have that flexibility. Formalize the strategy, support from the top, key, support from the top, and then change management and give the tools to the teams to be able to perform this, right? Number four, you manage an implementation, internal champions, the message often, remember those 17 times. And then fifth, last but not least, you reiterate the message and you include it in your planning cycle. Does this guarantee you success? Nothing guarantees anything in life. The only two things that are guaranteed in life are taxes and debt. Other than that, nothing is guaranteed, right? But I do believe, I strongly believe, and in my experience, this gives you a much better shot. So I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Otherwise, it's been an absolute joy to be with you today.